Let's turn in our Bibles to Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19. Verse 11, while they were listening to these things, Jesus went on to tell a parable. Because he was near Jerusalem, and they supposed that the kingdom of God was going to appear immediately. So he said, a nobleman went to a distant country to receive a kingdom for himself and then return. And he called ten of his slaves and gave them ten minas and said to them, do business with these until I come back. But his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him saying, we do not want this man to reign over us. When he returned after receiving the kingdom, he ordered that these slaves to whom he had given the money be called to him so that he might know what business they had done. The first appeared saying, Master, your mina has made ten minas more. And he said to him, Well done, good slave, because you have been faithful In a very little thing, you are to be in authority over ten cities. The second came, saying, Your mina, master, has made five minas. And he said to him also, And you are to be over five cities. Another came, saying, Master, here's your mina, which I kept put away in a handkerchief. For I was afraid of you because you are an exacting man. You take up what you did not lay down and reap what you did not sow. And he said to him, by your own words, I will judge you, you worthless slave. Did you know that I am an exacting man taking up what I did not lay down and reaping what I did not sow? Then why did you not put my money in the bank And having come, I would have collected it with interest. And he said to the bystanders, take the mina away from him and give it to the one who has the ten minas. And they said to him, Master, he already has. Uh, He has ten minas already. Verse 26, I tell you that to everyone who has, more shall be given, but from the one who does not have, even what he does have shall be taken away. But these enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them, bring them here and slay them in my presence. Wow. Sobering words. Let's look to our Lord. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for these um, wonderful words that are highly instructive and and greatly descriptive of the very age we're in. Thank you, Lord, uh, for the truths that we're going to be able to glean from your word that are just right there for us to to pick out. And Lord, I would pray that as we uh, turn our attention to this word, world word, you would help us to um, distract our attentions from the distracting world and that we would be able to focus in on your word, enjoy it, embrace it, internalize it, and live it. And by that, become better disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. Help me to be clear and helpful and accurate. And and I would pray, Lord, that the other, coming out the other end, we would be better equipped to be good servants of you in a hostile world, for we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we uh, are diving into this passage. Uh, Early on, I had expected it was going to be one sermon, perhaps two. Uh, As it turned out, it ended up being two sermons, and we're not done yet. Because there's this potentially troubling verse at the end. But these enemies of mine, who did not want me to reign over them, bring them here and slay them in my presence. Our Lord deliberately capped off this parable with that little bomb. And rather than 
kind of gloss over it quickly and just say, well, that was an interesting end to a story. All of the elements of this story were, were selected and made a part of the story for a, a very good purpose. And uh, so rather than gloss over that quickly, just so you know, we're, we're going to pick that one up the next time we get together in this passage. But let's go from where we are last week. We basically uh, studied the first two verses, and we saw that Jesus was teaching his disciples on the long walk up to Jerusalem, and it was going to be his final walk to Jerusalem for a very long time. Very soon, this crowd of the politically motivated but spiritually unenlightened were going to be crowning, shouting out, Hoshiana, Hoshiana, O Lord, save us now. They would be saying, blessed is the king as he comes into Jerusalem. You're going, man, this looks good. But they would be doing that. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord for political reasons, not spiritual reasons. And then with frightening rapidity and ease, a few days after that, they would be chanting again. Staru auton, staru auton lends itself really well to a crowd chant. Sta, ru, autan. Crucify him. Crucify him. Same people. Same people. And they would say, in connection with that, we have no king but Caesar. Political crowds are fickle crowds and, of course, can be quite deadly to believers. Well, as they were passing, just leaving uh, the environs of Jericho, they would have been passing the holiday palace of Archelaus. And because of that, Jesus tells them a parable. And what triggered the need was the guiding assumption of that crowd, and more importantly, his disciples, what they were assuming. The crowd assumed that Jesus was going up to take over the capital and then take over the world. And despite Jesus taking them aside, the disciples, and assuring them that he was actually, in fact, going to be handed over to the Gentiles and crucified at the insistence of the Jewish leaders, yet they did not understand, Scripture tells us. Going along in this crowd that was all amped up, here comes the king, had turned their brains to Teflon, and nothing seemed to stick. So, Jesus told them a story that coincided very neatly with the story of Archelaus, whose palace they were walking by. Archelaus had been ushered into the capital about, ah-ish, 30 years earlier. As the heir apparent, as a local king under Roman rule. But the crowd turned on a dime and wanted to kill him within a week, right about the time of the Passover. So Archelaus left the palace where he was to rule and went to authority headquarters, Rome. The citizens made it clear that they do not want this man to rule over them. They hated him. But the high authority of Rome installed him anyway and sent him back after a time of absence. And Archelaus took back his kingdom and dealt with the dissident citizens. The logic of telling a parable is that you're taking something very familiar to the audience and laying it beside what you're wanting to teach them. It also has the effect of, also like all parables, of concealing truth to part of the audience, the ones not spiritually alive, and giving more information to the part of the audience that is sympathetic to the cause, in this case, the disciples. But as they're walking up, and as he's telling the story, if, if the individuals are, let's say, junior high age or above, they're all very familiar with this story. It's part of the political thing that's been happening all around them for the last few years. So they're very much acquainted with this. As he starts into it, they know exactly the story and where it's going. Very, very uh, good illustration for that reason. 
Actually, Jesus would use this same basic setup when he was teaching in Jerusalem just before the Passover, so just in a matter of a few days after this, a few days in the inter, in, uh, intermediate time between him going up to Jerusalem and being crucified, he starts another one. Actually, why don't we turn there for a moment? Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25. You can see that he is using this same basic point of history that they're all familiar with, and once again, he's using it as a, as a teaching aid. Verse 14, for it's just like a man about to go on a journey. See the points of similarity here. Who called his own slaves and entrusted his possessions to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one each according to his own ability. So here he's talking about, and, he's, and the point is there's a different point to this parable. He's teaching a, a slightly different lesson, but he's saying here they got different stuff. They got given different things, and it was a judgment call, and, and it was based on what the nobleman figured the other individual was capable of. So it was, it was not just random, there, there was an assessment and then a gifting of, in this case, a huge amount. Um, immediately the one who had received the five talents went and traded with them and gained five talents more. Just so that you know what talents are, the word talent in the English tends to do double duty and we're kind of thinking, oh, okay, so he's talking about whether you can strum a guitar or not or you can flip a pancake. No, that's not what's going on. Uh, the, the word talent here actually ha is uh, the word that is talking about a particular weight unit of money, and it's a king's ransom. Okay, it's a king's ransom even if it's silver, if it's gold, it's mind-boggling. Uh, so it's talking about a, a huge, huge amount of money, whereas we're talking about the minas in Luke, and it's, it's maybe not uh, so much. It's a big chunk of money. You'd miss it but uh, it, it's not quite the same as this one. So, same parts, a man is about to go on a jury, journey, be a while away for a while, then return and find out his slaves, what his slaves did with their tasks and his stuff. So, mere days apart, Jesus uses this very familiar concept of the owner-leader going away for a period of time and bringing reward for service and judgment for rejection when he returned. In the Matthew edition, Jesus says he'll be gone for a very long time. Very long time. So, in our passage, back in Luke chapter 19, let's uh, focus in on this for a bit. He says, the community around, the, the citizens, hated him. Sent a delegation. Uh, a very apt representation of who they were to headquarters and say, none of us want this guy. Not completely true. There were a very few who would be willing to be loyal to the actual rightful king. But the citizens say, no, we reject him. We reject him. Well, what an environment, what a dangerous assignment the nobleman then gives to these few who are loyal to him. And he says to this group of people who he's leaving behind, he says uh, a very interesting word in the Greek. You've been just dying to learn another word in the Greek, no doubt. He says, I want you to pragmat us este. And the first little bit until I started, you know, doing the us theis and stuff, you, you kind of were picking up on pragma oh, pragmatic, pragmatic. And you're quite right, that's where we get our English word, pragmatic. But what it means here is, conduct business in my name for my benefit. I want you to be common sense and savvy. Take care of things that are entrusted to you until I return. You say, is that what that word means? Yes, and you can conduct, you can uh, look that up in any standard work. That's what's being said. Take those things that are mine and have now been entrusted to you and do things profitable to my kingdom until I come back. That's the charge. 
Employ it. Do business with it. Use it for the benefit of the real owner who will be returning in power. And do that right in and among those that despise the slave because they despise the master. What an environment to try and conduct business. As we go through here, we see that each of the ten slaves he calls to serve him in this parable get the same amount. One mina. A mina is about three months' salary for a paid laborer. In the parable of Matthew, Jesus changes this one up, and the man is giving each man a, a king's ransom, and, and, and they're all different, but these are given on two different occasions, and he's teaching two different lessons. Here, this parable is making reference to what each slave receives is given as a stewardship responsibility that is in common with each other slave. Time out. Hold the phone. What do you have in common with every other believer? What is it that God has given you that is absolutely in common with every other believer? Because we tend to focus on, oh, they have one of those, so they, I want one of those. They have one of those, oh, I didn't get one of those. Or, Where's my water buffalo? You know, that whole thing. He had a water buffalo. Um, how come he gets three penguins? You know, all that thing where we, where we see that if, it has, if it's fair, it has to be equal. And of course, we should know by now, equal is rarely fair. But there are some things that are fair. Do we all get the same number of days allotted to us? No. But the days that are allotted to us, we get 24 hours, every one of us. Every one of us, in the days that we have, we can make some decisions about who we're going to serve and what we're going to do in it. We don't have the same number of days, but we have generally the same latitude of I'm going, to, I'm going to do this as a priority in my life over that. Okay? There are a number of other things that we have in common. We don't all have the same education background. Um, but how many here have a Bible? You guys are so pessimistic here that that was a trap. You're, you're so suspicious that whatever happens, we're Baptists, so we're not going to raise our hands anyway, but, but we're certainly not going to raise our hands because it's probably a... Tra Let's try it. How many of you guys have Bibles? Okay. But you haven't all studied them the same, right? They haven't all, but, but you had access to it. This particular parable, um, it's been in this passage for 2,000 years. Uh, not everyone has an equal grasp on it, but it's been there. It, it isn't that it's snuck into the text and, oh, lo and behold, something crept into my passage. No, th there's some things that, are, that we have in common. One of the things that you have in common is that if you are a genuine believer, you've been baptized into the body of Christ, there's a whole bunch of implications of that. You have immediately, it, you develop this with your attention to the word and so forth, your discernment, but you have a snow meter immediately installed. And that snow meter can be improved in terms of its calculation and its, and its uh, ability to really discern error. But, but you, you've been given a snow meter where you're going, oh, no, that, I, I don't think that's right. Okay, So there's a lot of things that you have in common. And so this parable is talking about swag. Stuff we all get. Okay? So, I hope that's helpful for you. Each one of the ten slaves gets the same amount. So, verse 15. He says, When he returned after receiving the kingdom, he ordered that these slaves to whom he had given the money be called to him so that he might know what business they had done. He came back... And rule was immediate. Rule was not a contested thing over a period of time. Rule was immediate. And he, it says, lambanaod the kingdom. He laid hold 
and took possession of that which was his right to possess. He then calls his slaves to find out what they have accomplished of the task he has given, to use the stuff he gave them to, and we've got our word again, uh, our, our vocab word for the day, pragmata us este, only it's way bigger than that. Okay, so to that basic word, there is a prefix, dia, in front of it, which means through the process of here. So there's a, a dia in front of it. And then there's some suffixes added to the end of that. And the whole thing of it means one word that almost sounds like a paragraph, but it is to procure gain. So doing business, acquire a gain on investment on what has been entrusted to you, all in one word. Man, that, it's a, Greek is a cool language, but that's what he's, uh, I've come back to see how much gain you have achieved through doing business with this money I gave to you. Verse 16. The first appeared saying, Master, your mina has made, made ten minas more. Rather resourceful. Unless he's quite a crook, but he's been rather resourceful, and you'd have to say that that was uh, undoubtedly, and the context proves out, over a period of time. He didn't kind of turn it into times 10 overnight. Long-term, consistent, relentless diligence and dedication to the task is what is being talked about here. Or a word we're going to, I hope, have a bigger frame around it for us, faithfulness. Faithfulness. It is required of a steward that he be found faithful. That's the highest calling of a steward. And this is a wonderful success story that we have in this passage. It required him to be keen and inventive, ingenious and resourceful. I say this not, uh, bec because not everyone came back with that same kind of return. Not everyone came back, oh, you, well, you got 10 times, so, so we all did. I mean, we lived in the same world. Um, not all had the same kind of return. He had done something special with a relatively small start. And he achieved this in a culture hostile to him because it was hostile to the master. Well, verse 17, and he said to him, Well done, good slave, because you've been faithful in a very little thing, you are to be in authority over ten cities. What we're seeing here is, in the very nature of the master that we are serving is, an inclination, a determination, a, a, uh, an, an absolute, this is who he is, this is his reputation, and it's well-deserved, an oversized reward for a relatively small amount of faithfulness. The, if you compare the amount of faithfulness to the kind of size of reward, it's completely outsized, oversized. And we see the kind of reward to anticipate. That's important too. Uh, he does not say, and he gave him 10 Rolex watches. He doesn't say... He gave him a 10-day trip to Pompeii, which was the kind of the Las Vegas of the day. He didn't say, and so he was faithful and he gave him 10 wives. Uh, that, it, it's not going that way. It says, the individual gets what every slave who loves his master wants. To be entrusted with more responsibility. That's the reward. He's the slave of a good master, so his needs will be provided with, provided for with a sense of generous grace. The, the slave is not insecure at that. But what he, as a savvy, hardworking investor, gets is administrative authority under the master in his kingdom over ten cities. That's the outcome. I frankly admit that I do not have the chops for that. Here, Howard, 
from here on in, run Calgary and Edmonton. <laughs> not on a bet. No, I, certainly not with the equipping that I have. Um, I would not want to be responsible for running Dewberry. It's, that's not my thing at the moment. But evidently, this time where the slave is able to demonstrate and develop skills is preparatory for even bigger, much, much bigger responsibilities in the future. In the parable, the master isolates on and focuses on key virtue he is wishing to particularly commend, and I'm going to commend to you that it is the issue of faithfulness. The success of the slave is not attributed by the master to an oil boom, the fortunes of war, or a lucky bounce on the stock market. The gain he attributes to being faithful with what he was given. Faithfulness includes timeliness, diligence, effort. By the way, you can't do anything about the level of um, natural ability that you have. You can, you can sometimes refine your abilities. You can, you can kind of work on coordination, but you, you can't do anything about your, your starting point. But here's one thing you can do. Effort. Faithfulness and effort. You can't always out-talent everybody else, but you can work hard. You can work hard. So, effort, thoughtfulness, not just putting your head down and, and you know, going like a bull. Persistence, consistency, and as my British grandmother would say, fortitude, um, courage sometimes gall. And I want you to note something about it. In this passage, note the, 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 the thrill and the joy expressed. Folks, fidelity thrills Jesus. Fidelity thrills Jesus. He delights in their service. He delights in their loyalty. That's something that blesses the heart of the Lord. Well, verse 18, the second came saying, your mina master has made five minas. And he said to him also, and you are to be over five cities. Oh, wait a minute. How come he didn't get 10 cities? Um, he might have been in a poor how come he didn't get 10 cities I mean doesn't everybody get 10 cities that's not that's not yeah. he did pretty good too why not just give everybody 10 cities to be fair and, and so we say that that's the only way that the bema of Christ can be operated on is everybody gets the same well there are some things you all get the same okay <laughs> He said, the last shall be first and the first shall be last when it comes to salvation. What does that mean? Other than it sounds a little bit confusing. Well, if the last is first and the first is last, it means they all finished in a dead heat. They all crossed the finish line together. And, and what he refers to there is, if you have your sins paid for in Christ, you all get heaven. And it's not like you're in a discount version of heaven over there. Okay? Wrong side of the tracks, and that's where the bugs are. That, there's, there's no bad parts of heaven. You're, you're not in some double-wide trailer over there that, uh, you know, the wheels are falling off. You, he, everyone finishes in a dead heat in salvation in terms of you go to heaven. But not everyone ends up with the same reward. Why doesn't he give ten services at cities to everyone, to be fair? Because this is a reward for service quality and intensity of service. And the reward is proportional to the effort and faithfulness. Is your mind starting to go to the bema of Christ that we talked about this summer? It should. 
Verse 20. Another came, saying, Master, here's your mina, which I kept away in a handkerchief. Just so that you understand it culturally, hiding in a napkin would be the equivalent of having something fairly valuable and hiding it in your sock drawer. It's not at all secure, and it was completely contrary, most importantly, to what was asked of him. He wasn't given the mina and said, here, stash it in your sock drawer. What he was told with is, employ it, use it to get business. Do business with it. Invest it. Not sit on it carelessly. The slave, at the end, expended no effort, no ingenuity, no time working for the master. That's the point. He was not going to have this occupy any part of his life. He was not going to be inconvenienced or have this be, certainly not be his raison d'etre for why I'm there. Not at all. He put absolutely no effort into it. The expenditure of time, energy, thought, and effort give demonstration of loyalty and love. The absence of these really betrays an absence of yeah, loyalty and love. Verse 21, why would you do that? For I was afraid of you because you are an exacting man. You take up what you did not lay down and reap what you did not sow. Actually, it's kind of amazing that he would have the, the gall, the moxie, to stand in front of his master and say that. Amazing that he would do that. He says, I was afraid of you. And, and with that, there is a connotation of, and with good reason, because of who you are. And he said, here's why I was afraid of you. You are an exacting man. Some of your translations have. It's the Greek word austeros. And yes, it does sound like austere and with good reason. It meant harsh, rough, graceless, and rigid. Harsh, rough, graceless, rigid. He says he has been in a constant state of fear of the master. It's an imperfect verb, the fear part. Then the slave says that the master takes up what he did not lay down and reaps what he did not sow. In other words, he's a thief who steals other people's crops. He says, you're a harsh, graceless thief and a marauding bully. I've heard hymns over the years. I'm pretty sure I've never heard any of God's redeemed people include descriptions like that in the hymns that they sing over the last hundreds of years. This is not a hymn of praise. This guy that is a character that is obviously a literary creation of Jesus in this allegorical story. Um, here he is. Is he really a believer? Is he an eternally saved and redeemed child of God, even though verse 22 says he's a worthless slave, a pane re slave? Well, we'll try and get into that a bit, but verse 27, it says, But these enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them, slay them right here in my presence. Is, is this guy destined to be part of that group or not? Well, again, it's a parable. It's a story. And, and he's trying to make a particular point. He's included some details that are important, and he's excluded some details that are extraneous. All right? So, this is a parable, and there's a point Jesus is making, and in this story, it's not a historical undertaking. This event has obviously not happened yet, and Jesus is addressing other main issues, not the broad issue of apostasy, so let's not go there. In the Matthew account, Jesus is making a different point, but he actually still brings this sort of guy into that account as well, where 
that guy gets thrown into outer darkness where there is weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth, and that is emphatically not any subdivision or suburb of the eternal joys of heaven. In the Luke account here, we see here in verse 22, he says, by your own words, I will judge you, you worthless slave. You worthless slave. It is the word panere. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the noun form of this, panere, the evil one. Oh, what does panere mean? Well, it's descriptive uh, of Satan, actually. Uh, actually, there, will you see a few more places where the word panere is is used and we'll kind of get a bit of a feel for maybe what it is. Go back to Matthew. We'll just take a few in a row here that in the book of Matthew. Verse 44, but I say, uh, I'm, you don't even know the chapter yet, do you? Ah, Matthew 5, sorry. It's right here in my notes. I didn't know why you didn't go there. Matthew 5. Verse 44, but I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven, for he causes his son to rise on the panere and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. And they're looking at it. He's saying these are ones who do not have attributed to them, imputed to them righteousness. Matthew chapter 7 We'll get a feel for the semantic range of this word. Verse 17, every good tree bears good fruit, but the panere tree bears panere fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. Okay, getting an idea? 13, Matthew 13. Thirty-eight. Oh, let's pick it up here. Then he left the crowds and went to the house. I'm in verse 36. And the di disciples came to him and said, Explain to us the parable of the tear, tares of the wheat. And he said, The one who sows the good seed is the son of man. And the field is the word. And as for the good seed, these are the sons of the kingdom. And the tares are the sons of the Here's our word. Uh, scoot down, if you will, to verse 49. So it will be at the end of the age, the angels will come forth and take out the paneros from the righteous. Okay, so you're getting an idea of the semantic range. He calls him that kind of a slave. Well, there's no point in speculating because, of course, this is a literary creation, not something from the annals of history, and it's not the point of this passage, but you're, you're going to get an idea of the fact that not, not every one of those that are apparently slaves are equally productive, and some are quite the contrary. So... Let's see what Jesus is laboring to teach. Back in Luke chapter 19, he said to him, verse 22, by your own words, I will judge you. In other words, he's saying, I don't have to uh, go and do the deconstruction of why everything you said was wrong. Let's just even just use your own words, use your own logic, you worthless slave. Did you know that I am an exacting man taking up what I did not lay down and reaping what I did sow? Then why did you not put my money in the bank? Interesting term there. It means the table and refers to the money changers table. There was a banking system back then. And having come, I would have collected it with interest. Here the nobleman says, if you really believed 
that, that you would have been bright enough to serve me even a little, but instead of lending it to the bank, you just hid it carelessly. Like he's in a no-win situation. If, if he really believes that, out of terror, he should have done something with it. Um, if he didn't believe it, he's lying in front of here and, and he's just using a really lame excuse. There's no way this is going to come out good, right? There's no way. He just hid it a bit carelessly. The slave went out of his way to prevent the master from having any return. Going and putting the money on the money changer said, Here, here's a loan, you can use it. And, and there would have been a nominal rate of interest that would have been returned for the money. Uh, why didn't you do, why did you not do just the bare minimum? What a great question. What a great question. It would have been absolutely no more labor to do that than to hide it in his sock drawer. What a great question. Why? Of all the options you had, why did you do that? And in light of your hostile opinion of the master, why did you do that? What a great question. What a great question. Unbelievers are not always consistent with what they believe, are they? Well, verses 24 and following. Then he said to the bystanders, Take the mina away from him and give it to the one who has ten minas. In the future, entrustment of honorable, noble responsibility will be given to those who have demonstrated over time faithfulness. That's what he's making the point of. As a device of the storytelling... Jesus includes an anticipated shock response and a questioning of the nobleman's methods in verse 25 by his followers. He's anticipating that some of his followers are going to say, whoa, whoa, what, what are you doing giving the 10 minus to that guy? What, what are you doing that for? He's, he's got lots already. Is this fair? Jesus anticipates this as a gut-level reaction common to even good slaves. But Jesus is teaching that future entrustment of kingdom service during his coming kingdom will be on the basis of faithfulness, not humanly perceived human notions of equity. That's what's going on. And you say, um, let's have a sense of proportion here. Giving a mina to a guy that already has authority over 10 cities is like giving a single milking goat to a guy who's now running the Douglas Lake Ranch. Almost comparatively an, an afterthought. But interestingly, the master judges, the mina will get better attention with this slave than a guy who has less on his plate. Because he's faithful. Because he's faithful. Again, the emphasis is on faithfulness, initiative, drive, effort. Verse 26, I tell you that to everyone who has, more shall be given, but from the one who does not have, even what he does have shall be taken away. What does that mean? But these enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them, bring them here and slay them in my presence. Well, so that's pretty grisly. What in the world does that mean? I'm looking at my watch and I'm saying, that might take a while. So, let's dive in and study what that means next week. No, week after. It's a cliffhanger. Come back and we'll talk about what that means. For now, what do we walk away and gather from this? The kingdom in its full final phase is not coming immediately. Check. The nobleman, Jesus, is going to die, resurrect, and ascend to the Father for a season. He's going away. And this isn't the first time. This isn't the only occasion where that has happened. Remember, let's go back again to Psalm 110.
the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand, settle in here for a bit, in the Hebrew, until, there's a time frame, until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Oh, how's that happening? The Lord, the Yahweh, will stretch forth your strong scepter. Yahweh is going to be doing something for the second person in the Trinity that's being addressed. Stretch forth your strong scepter from Zion, saying, Rule in the midst of your enemies. Wow. When the Messiah comes back, he will be coming to establish his rule amongst a group of enemies. Enemies. Your people will volunteer freely in the day of your power. Ah. In holy array from the womb of the dawn, your youth are to you as the dew. And it goes for... Read the whole thing, you go, oh, you mean... You, you mean this, is, this was talked about before? Very much so. So much so that a luminary like Peter on the very, very beginning of the church age says this to a group of people. Go to Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3. He's addressing a group of people who had crucified the Lord. And he's reasoning with them. Verse 17 of Acts 3, And now brethren, meaning, not you guys are all believers, brethren, you guys are fellow Jews, okay? I know that you acted in ignorance, just as your rulers did also. What you did was dumb. That was a dumb, dumb move. But the things which God announced beforehand by the mouth of all the prophets, you go, really? All? Oh boy, yeah. Uh, just wander your way through Daniel, Isaiah, Jeremiah, all the minor prophets, you go, so this kind of stuff is talked Yes, this kind of stuff is talked about. Through the mouth of all the prophets, that his Christ would suffer, he has thus fulfilled. That has been a common theme all the way through the, 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 the prophets. And that's why Jesus says to the guy on Emmaus, he says, How slow you are to believe everything that is prophesied about the Lord. That was the point. They had gone to the idea of, hey, we're going to rule the world, and they'd forgotten this point. He has to suffer. In fact, he has to die. They were missing that point. By the way, have you ever been thankful for the fact that he didn't just take over power? That he didn't just take over rule? If Jesus had marched up to Jerusalem and just taken over, it was his right. He could have gone in there with legions of angels. One angel is all that we needed. He could have taken over. And as we learn from Scripture, he didn't need one angel. He could have done it himself. Have you ever been thankful for the fact he walked into Jerusalem and laid down his life? If he had decided to walk into Jerusalem and take his due, he'd have been king. He'd have been conqueror. And he would have needed to deal with you and me in righteousness and we'd have been the enemy and he'd have had to slay us in his presence but he walked up to Jerusalem and even though he's a king and he could have resisted he didn't he was insistent that one of the intermediate steps before becoming the conqueror warrior that he is he would first of all die on a cross, be spat upon, be the subject of all kinds of horrifyingly, devastatingly humbling things, hang naked on a cross, and die for our sins. He insisted 
that that preceded him coming as a conqueror. And as a matter of fact, he insisted that preceding that, there would be a time that his followers mingle in and around that same world that hated him and do business. I'm so glad my Lord decided to come first as a sacrifice for sin and not a conqueror, that he decided to be a savior, not just king. Anyway, God announced beforehand by the mouth of all his prophets that his Christ would suffer. He did. And he has thus fulfilled that, he says. Therefore, he's saying to this group of people, repent and return so that your sins may be wiped away in order that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Oh, in, in what way would that be? That he may send Jesus. Oh, so there's going to come a time where he is going to send Jesus, the Christ, the anointed one, appointed for you, whom heaven must receive until the period of restoration of all things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from ancient times. So he says, I'm going to have to die, resurrect and ascend to the Father for a season. I'm going away. This is not going up to inauguration. They're all ready to go, Hoshiana, Hoshiana, their version of all hail the chief. And he's going, that's not happening. Wrong time frame. That's not happening now. There's, there's, there's a number of things that have to precede that. What's about to happen in Jerusalem, boys, is not what the crowd thinks, and it's not what you're still thinking. Jesus is going away for an extended period. And there's going to be a period of time when, in his physical absence, you operate within and among a group of people and an entire culture that opposes, rejects, resents, and has a really low opinion of the one true king. Quit jockeying for position among yourselves as to who's going to sit at the right hand of Jesus in the kingdom, which they will be doing. Nevertheless, in days. Start thinking about embracing yourself for doing business for the king in the midst of a people who hate him. That's where your headspace needs to be. It's going to be an extended period of time. What is required now at this moment and all through your life until he returns is faithfulness. Faithfulness. Faithfulness includes ingenuity. It includes expenditure of time, energy, thought, and effort. Giving a demonstration of loyalty and love of first priority the king who is in exile among a people who are in rebellion, operating as a seemingly fragile minority. That's what life is going to look like for you lot. And look at that. That's what life looks like for us lot. Right? That is it. He says, for example, Paul says, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Why do you need to be redeeming the time? Because it's constantly being competed over and stolen. Right? You're constantly facing things in your life where you're going to divert away from serving the Lord and, and doing something that is rather self-serving. The consequence will be the degree of reward in the kingdom at the Bema. But more importantly, and maybe more immediately, the consequence is going to be the sunlight of the joy of your Father in heaven, His Son, 
and the Spirit as they look upon day by day consistent diligence and faithfulness and that folks he's he's laboring to make clear thrills the heart of Jesus isn't that amazing isn't that isn't there a longing in your heart to go there so application time I kind of wanted to run to the cutting, cutting people up in my presence, but we're not going to go there yet. That's next time. Application for this time. Did you get up this morning and reaffirm that Jesus is the master of your time, your day timer, your resources, your mental processes, your, your loyalty, and your own empire always takes a back seat? as a matter of integrity. Did you do that? Next question. Are you prepared and are you dedicated that you're going to do that again tomorrow? Tomorrow when the world rushes in. So believer, what are you going to do to this period of time that you have as a life and you have a little bit of time that you can show yourself faithful or faithless. And we should finish this with one other. In this room, you are either a dedicated slave of the Lord Jesus Christ, intent and absolutely determined to serve him, or you're an enemy of Christ. There's no halves. And just as a, may, a way of inducement, and, and this is not just a, a scare tactic, you need to understand, if you live your life as an enemy of Christ, notwithstanding what you profess yourself to be, if you live for you instead of for the king, there is going to come a day where God's going to cut you down. In fact, he says in Matthew, you will be thrown out into outer darkness where there's weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. So my last question is, as you sit here today, do you have Jesus Christ as your sin bearer? Or are you hell bound as we speak? You've probably thought that one through a few times and you've probably um, heard a message like this before. And so you're going to make a fresh decision today walk out of here under the wrath of God or finally quit rebelling and bow your head and your knee to the rightful king. Heavenly Father, thank you that you were willing and insistent on first coming as a savior Thank you, Lord, that you willingly had the legal outcome, the legal standing of our sinfulness legally imputed to yourself so that the Father could pour out his wrath on you. Oh, Lord, why would you do that for the likes of us? And then as an even greater expression of your grace you permitted that your legal standing be charged up to our account our legal standing so that we would have the legal standing of Christ and therefore we could enter heaven if we will put our full, full faith and trust in that not in our good works project or some other method of securing your favor Thank you, Heavenly Father, that you did the work 
and it was a monergistic work. It was where you did all of the work to redeem us. Heavenly Father, it's my prayer again that for those who are redeemed, we would go out of here and we would just reaffirm a master like that. I just gotta, I just, I just have to serve him. And if there are any who are not and are under your wrath, would you arrest them? Would you stop them in their tracks? Download new life into them. Cause them to be born from above. Lay down arms in opposition to you and acknowledge you as the one true king. Would you do that by your grace, in your mercy, for your glory and our joy, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless, and we'll call on the music team.